uh, first of all, welcome. I appreciate you. Um, you know, we're getting right into the presentation. Um, I'll sprinkle in a little bit of um, some of the things that our students experienced in our financial um, literacy program. I don't know if you had an opportunity, if you had any students who happened to participate in it. Um, but there's a couple of things before we uh, get started with our presentation for tonight. Um, uh, one of the things is if your students at all, you know, got anything out of the financial literacy program that we did come, uh, that we did put on for those, you know, seven uh, to nine weeks. Um, I want to give the biggest of shout outs to Hong Vu. Hong Vu is a licensed financial professional in the area. Um, she's in the Boston area and, um, you know, she has been working, uh, consulting and helping just really, for me, you know, we had to build this program basically from the ground up because, um, you know, we don't have, you know, I was trying to figure out, hey, you know, we decided that we wanted to put this program together and I was going like, hey, do we have any financial literacy programs out there that students have ever had or, you know, that, that exist? And we found that there aren't that many that are student centered, um, you know, that are really informative. We have ones that are that just teach them things, but there, we don't have ones that are interactive that students can really understand. Um, and, you know, me, as well as Hong Fu, Christina Tali, Mr. McCarthy, we put our heads together and we, you know, so she has been super instrumental. Um, normally, she would lead this presentation for today. Um, however, um, about two or three hours ago, um, you know, uh, we learned that she had a last minute family emergency. I won't go into the details, but if you happen to have any positive, uh, positive, thoughts or, or, or any of those things, feel free to send it both to her and her family. Because um, unfortunately, because of that emergency, um, she won't uh, be able to join us tonight. However, um, there is uh, some, an opportunity at the end of this that I'm going to talk about. And if you also have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll try my best to answer them well, with the knowledge that I have. Um, but our hope is that um, you know, we'll uh, be able to have her get back to you because one of the things that we're hoping to do through uh, this particular um, uh, presentation is kind of to start the process of really having a series where we can get um, more of our families informed about it. Because there's some things that we're going to talk about today that I myself didn't really know that much about. And you know, I know that there are some people who are older than me who also didn't know that much about. And so when we talk about investment, um, this is her email. It's her real email, Hongvu Financial Services. Um, this is her real phone number. Um, and so feel free to reach out to that. But I just wanted to uh, give her some, some, some love. And she's been super amazing. And so I just want to shout her out because she's super amazing. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that is a highlight of her company um, is the fact that, or her particular practice is that uh, she has represented a lot of different companies. As you can see, um, there's a lot of different things. You might have seen some of these, um, Fidelity, Prudential, um, Invesco, uh, uh, Transamerica. There's a lot of uh, companies that are here Right. And so, um, you know, the people that she happens to work with in the past have been really five star companies, right? Ones that have really high rating. And what she found out is she, um, oh, yes, that's true. So if you, uh, uh, like Ms. Dina Tali said, if you can put your student's name in the chat, you're certainly welcome to. Um, uh, that to me is, is super, super helpful. And so I appreciate uh, uh, Leah being able to start that process. Um, however, when she was working for those Fortune 500 companies, one of the things that she found out is that there are really two different types of families, right? America has two different types of uh, families and they're put into these different categories. There's family A, and family A usually comprises about, what, 95% of all of the Americans, right? Individuals who earn 100000 or less, they have a job, right? Maybe they have a 401k uh, plan. They maybe earn, 
excuse me, own some type of term life insurance. They have, they rent their home, right? They put money in a bank, those kind of things. And then there's family B. And the 5% individuals are those who are wealthy, individuals who earn more than 250,000 or more. And just so we can see, uh, as my students know, I'm a very interactive person because anybody put in the chat or you could just unmute yourself. Let's see if we can do that. Um, you might see a difference. What is the difference between family A and family B? See if we can get at least like one difference. Anybody? <laughs> I should probably just give it to you because Ms. Dina Tali said I'm just trying to scrunch this down into 45 minutes. She was like, nah, nobody's going to stay here for that. And so um, one of the things uh, that you hopefully can notice is that the people on the right hand side are usually what? They're business owners. They're people who have permanent life insurances. And that to me is something that's extremely important. I didn't know um, that with life insurance, you can actually um, benefit from life insurance while you're alive. I thought life insurance is something that you do when you pass away, but you can, uh, people who are wealthy because they understand finances, um, they actually use their life insurance in order to kind of help um, uh, live a tax-free life. Um, they usually own their own home. And then they have a, a diversified portfolio and are debt free. And we're going to talk about how they have maximized their tax advantage in order for them to do well. Um, the important thing to note is that, you know, most of the time is that it comes with planning. And one of the problems that we find is that a lot of the people in family A, they don't have that financial literacy. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to highlight. Like I said, there are the two different types of individuals. There are um, individuals who are in the 95%, the most, uh, most of the people like you and me, and then there's the 5%, the people who are really wealthy. And one of the things um, that uh, separates them is the fact that the people who are in that 5% have these three things, okay? One of them is that financial discipline. Right, being able to understand that I'm going to pay into the system in order for them to be able to get and generate more well, uh, worth, excuse me, more wealth later, and that becomes super important. Um, like I said, um, uh, as I'm going through these slides, if you've never heard or have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat because um, it'll be super helpful and it'll let me know. Um, what kind of things I should emphasize on the different slides. One of the other things is the rate of return. And that is one of the, probably the biggest ways um, or one of the biggest differences is where people put their money, right? Having the financial discipline to put a, uh, a system or a schedule for their money together and then making sure that we put it someplace um, so that we have a higher rate of return than normal. And then the last one is taxes and how we can, by putting our money in certain places, we can make it so that our money is tax free. And so that becomes extremely important. And there actually happens to be a wealth formula. Um, uh, one of them has to do with money, being able to once again, have that financial discipline to put your money in a particular um, place, and then allowing for time right? Time to allow that money to grow, right? If you have all of these things, time, I have a high rate of return, and then we're able to generate our wealth, we have to think about what determines our wealth. What happens? We generate money. We allow time to build our money. We have a high rate of return. What are the things that subtract from our wealth is inflation and then taxes. And so if we're able to make sure that these last two don't affect our money as much, we can, what, expand our wealth. And so that's kind of the idea around the different things that we're gonna talk about. One of the things that is common amongst the 95%, where do they put their money? Most people put them in a savings or checking account. And so when we think about a savings or checking account, what happens if you put your money in these types of accounts 
you get something called the circuit or certificate of deposit and the certificate of deposit the benefit is supposed to be that i put my money there and it generates a certain amount of wealth every single year by just being there right by just being in that account now if my growth is 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.5 is that a lot of growth does that seem like a lot of growth to you hopefully no does anybody know how much or what inflation is or how much it grows up every single year feel free to put that in the chat if you want to guess i'm a big fan of guessing games and so um, feel free to put how much you think inflation goes up every year because one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is the effect that if inflation has on our oh yeah christian that's pretty good um <laughs> that's really good actually um what is inflation inflation is a person's purchasing power right as inflation goes up the amount of money or the value of our money begins to go down, right? We need more of it. 4% um, is a really good guess because how much does inflation go up every single year? It goes up every single year, 3%, right? By 3%. And so what does that mean? When we think about putting our money in this particular area, we need our money to grow higher than 3% because if our money doesn't go higher than 3%, then we're actually losing money. Right. A good example of that is 20 years ago, um, if you happen to have $20, you can buy all of your groceries. Right? You can go to a, a convenience store 20 years ago and just be able to load up on your groceries. When in today's world, how much can $20 actually buy you? Right. Some fruit, some vegetables. And that's about it. Another example of that is if you were to look at the cost of coffee. Right. In 1970, uh, coffee costs 25 cents. Now fast forward to 2019 and it's a dollar 59. Right? My my parents, I don't know if they we still tell kids this cuz it's not true for my generation, but my 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 experience growing up was oh, you know, older generation used to tell us for like $1 you could go to the store and just get like a whole bag of of candy, you know. And so that, that's what I remember. And so inflation is very important. And so if it's going up 3%, if our money is not growing higher than 3%, then we're actually losing money just by simply um, having it exist. And so we need to have a 3% rate. Does anybody know something called the rule of 72? It's a really important concept. In fact, Hong Vu told me, um, and she says this and emphasizes it in every single one of her presentations, that this might be one of the most important things to note. And the rule of 72 is one of my favorite things. Has anybody, you have to think back to your high school days. I'll give you the answer, but has anybody ever seen this equation before? It's a really interesting equation. Students always tell me that the things they learn in school don't really translate to the real life. But this right here, if you don't know, is the compound interest equation, right? That, for those people who go back into their algebra two and pre-calculus class. This is Albert Einstein. And so he came up with something called the rule of 72. And what he says is that 72 divided by the interest rate is the number of years it takes for your money to double. And he says that if I were to have an interest rate on my rate of growth, I will be able to determine how much uh, or how long it takes for my money to double. So for instance, if I put my money, I could take $20,000 and I put it into an account that uh, increases, it has an interest rate in terms of increase, my rate of return is 4%, my money would double in 18 years. And so if you know I put it $20,000 20, uh, in, in 18 years, it'll become 40,000. In another 18 years, it'll become 80,000, 4%. Let's say that I find you a, a rate of return that's 6%. It will double every 12 years, 20 to 40 to 80 to 160 by the time I'm 66. Let's say I find you a plan that has 8% and I put it in at, at the age of 30. That means that it will double every nine years, 
And so by the time I'm 66, I will have 320,000. If I were to find you a rate of return of 12%, then my rule of 72 or my rate of growth will be every six years. And so at the age of 30, if I put in $20,000, uh, $20, by the time I'm 66, I will have a million dollars. And so what I hope this illustrates is what? The importance of trying and having the knowledge to be able to find these high rate of returns. Do most people have the ability to find these high rate of returns? Not on their own, right? And so that's the reason why um, having someone who's financial literate is a very important thing. Do you might have any questions on this? Because like I said, the rule of 72 becomes extremely important to understand why it's important for you to be thinking about this type of thing. And we'll show you a scenario later on that you could um, potentially uh, do. I'm actually doing it um, with my uh, uh, niece right now. Oh. Yeah, so as you can see, there's a big difference between 80,000 and 1 million. Yeah, so that's basically the idea. Now, one of the big barriers is understanding the different options that you have for your money, okay? And most people operate in this way. There are three options. That's what uh, she found is that there are this first option, which she calls a fixed amount. I put my money into a savings account and it doesn't go up or down. It's just every single year my money increases, but it increases by a very small amount. That 0.5%, that 2% growth, right? I put it in a savings account and it only goes up a very small amount. Do we have a lot of opportunities for growth long-term? Not really, right? We don't have that opportunity. And this is, like I said, a bank, right? I put it in a bank account. This is what happens. Then we have the second one. And the second one is a variable investment or a place where you can put your money. Does anybody have, know an example of something that's in this type? Anyone? Like I said, I'm going to go really quick because Ms. Dean Tully said we're going to try to get out of here. Uh, um, uh, so this one, a good example is what? Most people, when they think about investment, yeah, there you go, Christian, um, is stock market, right? Most people think about this one. And this one has a lot of positives. The first positive is the fact that as you can see, you can have a high rate of return, right? If you invest in the stock market right away and your stock goes up, you have the ability to make a large amount of gains. However, what did we learn in 2008, right? In 2008, a lot of people invested their money in the stock market. And what happened? The stock market crashed and a lot of people lost their money right? People's 401ks were in the stock market. And so it's called the variable because you can earn a lot of money, but you can also lose a lot of that money. The one that most people don't know about, and this is the one that um, since I've known Hong Vu, she actually got me to start doing it, is something called an index. And what an index does is, as you can see, the rate of return may be smaller, but what is the one advantage? I'll give you 30 seconds because I'm gonna go fast. <laughs> the one advantage that this has is that you always, you always uh, uh, have a form of increase. As long as the market goes up, you will get money. If the market goes down, do you lose any money? No, you don't gain any money when it goes down. But every time that the stock market goes up, right, when you hear about the NASDAQ and they tell you how we're having record gains, you will always see a rate of investment, right? An investment that comes back. 
Um, and so being able to invest in these things called indexes um, are extremely important. And so one of the things that since I've uh, known Hongvu is putting my money in an index that kind of helps generate that wealth over time. Okay. Do you may have any questions so far? And so as I'm learning this, like, like I said, most of the time, most people think about investing their money in one of the places that are variable like stock markets. And so one of the things that I myself have been um, uh, exploring is how do I get into this index place where I can always make money? Which brings up a very important person. If you don't know who Warren Buffett is, he's one of the richest people in the world. He is a investor and he has two rules. He says, one, his first rule is to never lose money. His rule number two is never forget rule number one. And that's what he says. And so what he wanted to do is he wanted to, he made a lot of his wealth by putting it into these indexes, right? And understanding that rule of 72, that my money can double if I find a high enough interest rate. Now, how does taxes work and how does that affect our purchasing power, right? One of the things, there are three different types of taxes. Come on, there we go. One of them is where they tax you now, right? They tax you the instant that it happens. Uh, one of those examples, oh, oh, okay. I guess that we're gonna go through all the buckets first. Um, tax, tax now, there's also tax later, which means that they don't tax you at that time, but they tax you um, later on when they take it out. And then the last one is something called tax advantaged. And when we think about tax now, we're thinking about checking and savings account. We're thinking about money market and stocks. One of the interesting things about stocks is if your stock goes up, you still have to pay taxes if you were to take that money out, right? And that's one of the uh, drawbacks. Same thing with mu mutual funds. Same thing with investment properties. We're talking about real estate, we're talking about any of those type of things. And so you still have to pay taxes on it when you take that money out now. There's another bucket called tax later, which means that I put my money in a lot of people who are uh, paying into a retirement fund, right? I think about all those educators out there who are paying into 401, 403 B's, right? Annuities, IRAs, at least the traditional type. Um, they're called tax later because they don't tax your money while you put it in. But when you take it out after you retire, that's when they'll tax you. Then there's these things called tax never or tax advantaged. And some of these, and feel free to let me know in the chat whether you've heard of any of these because I had never heard of them at all. One of them is called the a Roth 401k. And then there's a Roth IRA. And both of these are very similar in the sense that if you put your money into these Roth IRAs, which are specific types of tax codes that if I put my money in there, you can't touch it. But if you put it in there for about 20 or 30 years, then as long as you don't, excuse me, touch that money for those 20 years, when you take it out, unlike the IRA traditional or the 401k, it will not be taxed when you take it out, as long as you do not do so before the, the, the 20 years, okay? And so these are extremely, extremely good. Another one you might um, have never heard of, I myself didn't hear about this at all, um, is a 529. Does anybody know what that is? That might be an important thing, especially as we start to talk about parents. Um, a 529 is like a Roth IRA, like a Roth 401, except for the fact it's designed for students. It's a, designed for young people. Um, what a lot of people do is they put money into these 529s um, and they operate just like Roth IRAs and Roth 401s. However, the person that you open this for has two um, conditions. One, they can't use the money until they're 22. And then the second one is they can only use this money on education expenses. expenses. So you cannot use it. Yeah, it's only for school, okay? And so uh, 
yeah, so what if uh, uh, the teenager doesn't go to school? So let's say a person doesn't go to a college or something like that, and you wanted to take money out of this 529, they would then, they would, uh, you would, the one bad thing about these tax never plans is that if you try to take your money out of them before the time frame, you will get a penalty. They'll both tax you, and usually you get a penalty on top of that. So there are um, some drawbacks, but the really amazing thing about it is that if you, let's say you meet that 20 year threshold or whatever your plan's threshold is, it means that you'll basically be tax free. And so one of the things that Hong Vu said is the fact that what do the rich people or people who are wealthy do? They put their money here and then by the time the person gets to be an adult, right? The person, they open them when they're born, when they're one years old. And then by the time the person is 20 years old off to college, 20 years has passed and they can take it out tax-free. This is how, if you're a rich person, you hide your wealth, right? That's why, that's how you don't pay any taxes. You just put it here, fast forward your life 20 years, and now you have it. It's, a, it's an interesting strategy. So let's go through some scenarios. Let's say that I happen to put money into this tax now, which has stocks. I'm going to put $100,000 in my stocks. And if you don't know, we, uh, if you have the tax now, you have to pay 15 to 20%, which is about 15% on the 100000 that you paid. And so you get to take home $85,000, okay? Let's say that we are in the 401k and we raised that same amount, right? We raised that, we did a really good job. We raised that 100k. Tax later happens to tax us at a different um, amount. And so here we only get to keep 65% of it. Let's say that we happen to have one of these tax nevers where we have a hundred thousand. We don't have to pay any of the taxes. And so we get to keep all of it. And so being able to understand that system, once again, you have to go into it knowing that you're not going to touch this money for 20 years, but you can see how it has a huge financial, financial uh, benefit. Do you might have any questions so far? Now, how can market risk hurt you, right? We look at stocks and a lot of people view that as a really good way to increase their money. And so when we talk about stocks, why is that or why can it be a difficult thing? And we'll see if people can do a math problem um, in the 11 minutes that I have. I'm, I'm gonna meet the 45 minutes the entire year wait. You see, I'm, I'm going to pick it up. Only if you feel comfortable. You have to come <laughs> with the material. That is very true. <laughs> um, and so let's say I tried to invest $100 and I lost 50% of my wealth. And so that means I have 50% or excuse me, $50. I lost 50%. Does anybody know how much percent would I have to get in order to get my money back? I lost 50%. How much in percentages would I have to invest to get my money back? Sometimes this can be a really interesting trick question for a lot of people, but it illustrates a really good example as to why when you deal, yeah, right, uh, Christian's exactly right, more than 50%. A lot of people will say that I need to get 50% back. You lost 50%. 50% of 50 is actually 25. Oh. If you lose 50% of 100, what? Oh, yeah, that's what I just said. Um, so if, if I have $50, right, and I add 50%, I only added what? $25 to that. And so I only have $75. How much would I have to? I have to get 100% of my money back. How likely do you think? it is for the market to give you a rate of return of 100%. It's not very likely, right? And so this is the trap that a lot of people fall into, 
they go into the stock market, you put your money someplace, you get this high rate of return and you continue to follow the cycle. But if you have a, a point where you lose 50% of that, it'll take 100% for you to get back to where you were. And that's why like investing into the stock market as opposed to these indexes can be a little bit tricky. That's not to say that these are bad things to invest in if you know how, but those indexes are the ones that help give you a stable foundation. Let's talk about um, what that might look like, the index investment. Um, and so we looked, right? Most of our students, we did a poll of how, how old students were. And so we looked at what would happen if a person saved early versus save later. And so most of our students, I would say, uh, we, we did a poll as to, you know, what the youngest age or the average age of the students in our financial literacy program. And most of them were about 14 or 15. And we tried to figure out what would be a manageable amount to invest in per month. Let's say that you're a family and you can invest or put $100 per month into your investment account. And so if I put $100 per month, by the end of the year, I will have put $1,200 into my account, right? 100 times 12, 1,200. And so every single year, this particular family, if they started an account at, uh, at $100, 1,200 per year, and this column here tells you how much money they would have by the end of that year. If I put 1,200 in the first year, I'll get 1,296, you, you, you would increase your money by $96. Let's say that I did that for the next nine years and you can see how it plays itself out. And let's say I stopped, I didn't touch this for the next 20, excuse me, the next, do your math, Mr. Douglas, 28 years. Yes, that's right, <laughs> 28 years. So I put in, $1,200 for nine straight years. And then I just left my money there and didn't add a single cent. If, as you can see, by the time the, this person who was 14 was 50, they would have increased their money to $139,000. So that's with a $10,000 investment, which I realize is a lot, you will have accumulated 139000 simply by only putting your money in those first nine years. Let's say that I decided instead to not invest over those first nine years. Instead, I finally decided I was convinced, hey, Mr. Douglas, you've convinced me. I want to start to do it, but now it's nine years later. And instead, I'm going to do 1,200 every year until I'm 50. As you can see, if we started later, investing. If I started later investing, by the time I'm 50, once again, paying 1200 for 28 years, I will have contributed $33,000. And will I have made as much as the person who started early? No. That's the interesting thing about that rule of 72 and being able to understand compound interest and starting now, right? Like if you talk to a financial license professional right now, you could see this difference, which I think is extremely important for, for parents and families to understand, right? 139,000, that's a college education, right? That's potentially a house, right? These are, these are important things to think about as far as that growth. This is 10,000 turning itself into 139,000 versus 33,000, still a lot of money, but definitely not as, um, you know, a lot more that I had to contribute. This one um, is one that talks about the different types of cash flow quadrants. Um, one of the things um, that uh, one of the books that we try to get students to read and just letting you know, Mr. McCarthy still has a box of them in his office, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And so I strongly suggest that people um, go and get a copy, 
pop a copy, act like you in the financial literacy program, be like, yo, even if you're not, just be like, yo, Miss McCarthy, I was in that, and just get the get the book. It's free. That's boom. He's telling you right now. Come get some. Um, he says that there are um four different types of individuals. There are individuals who are in the E employee um uh bucket. And he says that those are individuals who have a job, and what they do is they um, trade their time for money. That's what they do. He's, he said that there are also a second one, people who are self-employed. And so people who are self-employed, they think that they're, um, that they're a step up because of the fact that you have your own job and you get to decide your own hours and everything like that. However, are those people any different than the first uh, group? No, right? They're you think you own your job, but really your job owns you, right? You're still trading time for money, more money, hopefully, but still money. Then there are the people in this business side, people who own a business. And instead of them themselves working, what happened is they own a system and people work for them and they operate within that system. And so people not you, but people are able to generate more money. A good example of this is like fast food, right? Where you created a system for people to make hamburgers, but you don't have to be there in order to do it. And then the last bucket is when money works for you. Being able to, um, just like in the last slide, be able to make it so that I have money and what do investors, what do rich people want to do? They want to put their money somewhere and have that money make more money for them. And so the question is, how do we um, make it so that people can go from active income into passive income? And so being able to understand where to put your money over a short period of time can help you get that long-term growth. Why is this important? It's important when we think about um, the increased cost of education right? Um, one of the things that we talked about in our um, part of the uh, financial literacy program is the fact that there's a rising cost of higher education, especially when we think about private school versus public school. One thing I want to plug is public schooling is really nice. We live in a world, I know everybody wants to go to Harvard and, and all those amazing schools, but we are very fortunate that we have amazing state schools. UMass, don't sleep on them. UMass Boston, UMass Lowell, UMass Amherst. I want to push them and tell you that, like, I tell students all the time, those are amazing options. And some of the best learners and educators in the entire world. Um, and so, as you can see, the cost of private institutes um, versus public education, um, I want to push that because I think it's that important. It's important to understand that education cost has doubled every 10 years. And think about how many children you have, and then think about, are you ready for that expense, right? How do we get ourselves and our students ready in order for them to understand this new world? When we think about education planning, right, we're thinking about financial aid is equal to the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution, right? That, um, that financial aid that they give you is based off of this equation cost of attendance, how much it costs, the tuition to go there, minus your expected family contribution that you get. How do they calculate the EFC? The way that they determine your EFC, what your family will contribute is from your checking and savings. If you guys don't know your FAFSA, you have to turn that in. And this is how they come up with the financial aid that they give you. What are the things that they, I don't wanna say hold against you, but they include in your expected family contribution. One of them is your checking and savings. That's why you have to give that information, how much money is in your bank account. Some of them is in stocks, right? If you have stocks, they actually count that against your expected family contribution. If you have mutual funds, one of the important things is that 529 that you might've put together actually um, hurts you in some ways as well. If you have investment properties, let's say you have, own a home, right? Let's say you, you are own real estate. That also um, is counted against your financial aid. Same thing um, uh, if you have a resident home. Now, that's only for private schools. 
What don't they include? Retirement assets, right? Your 401k, your 401b, or excuse me, 403b, the an annuity, those Roth IRAs, the Roth 401k. And so once again, I just want to go back to that slide, how much no, this particular portion on the right hand side this tax net tax never is that included in your expected family contribution no and so it's doing like double duty for you if that makes sense it's both making it so that it's tax never they're never going to tax it as long as you keep it in there for that amount of time and it's also not being counted in your expected family contribution once again what is an advantage this is how rich individuals make it so that they don't have to pay. Okay. What is an example of that? One second. Um, is when you look at your FAFSA, right? They drafted this law. Um, and when we think about FAFSA, it's important to note um, all of the things that I just said, right? Investments also include 529 plans, 529 prepaid tuition plans. Um, and so, what people are doing is putting them what in your life insurance policy, right? Putting money into your life insurance policy. What you want to create is a life insurance policy that also doubles as an investment account. One of the things that I, I myself have been able to put together recently um, uh, is putting together a life insurance plan that also doubles as an investment account. And so that's helpful. 401, uh, excuse me, Roth IRAs. Roth um, uh, 401ks. Once again, I want to push and tell people this, but most people don't know about these options or how to get involved in those things. I showed this slide to my students um, and why it's important because when I went to college, I didn't know anything about taxes or excuse me, uh, about, about student loans. I didn't understand the differences between them. Um, I thought that you, I knew, I, I think I understood percentages and um, interest rates, um, but I didn't understand the different types. If you have a subsidized loan, what that means is that the amount that you take out is the amount that you take out. So for this subsidized loan, I have a 2.4% and I ended up paying $921.87 when I graduated, that's the total amount that I would have to pay, um, pay back. The ones that are unsubsidized, what I didn't realize is that I took out 2,600 and at 2.4%, um, you know, that amount happens uh, to be 2,663. Did I only have to pay this amount? No, I ended up paying by the end 3,315. Why? Because every single year, because it's not unsubsidized, they didn't just take out the interest, they added interest every single month. So I had to pay not just the principal, but I had to pay the interest as well. And I didn't realize that. So by the time I graduated, I had, um, they had increased my, my loan amount, not 2,600 or the 2,600 that I took out, but it ended up being 3,315. And what that meant is that I borrowed $17,000 and I ended up paying $21,000 back. That may not seem like a lot because I know that there are some really horrible stories about people paying hundreds of thousands, but that difference is 23%. I ended up paying 23% interest, which is really high. Does anybody have any questions about why being able to get involved with the Roth IRA, Roth um, 401b, being able to look and invest in these uh, indexes? Does anybody have any questions about that? Because that's kind of the end of this particular part of the presentation. I want to talk a little bit or just give some voice. Um, one of the things, so the fact that our family worked in order to get a home will affect my boy scholarship. It, it can, yeah, because that's, it's going to be in there. It's one of the, it's one of the things that is, that is put in that uh, expected family contribution. Um, and 
it's 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 an unfortunate thing and one of the things that we want to figure out is how can we get some of our money into this section right that's the question and if we're financially literate or we can talk to somebody who is um we can start to put our money in this section i want to talk a little bit and just give some voice um we've been talking to some students about some of the um changing landscape in terms of financial literacy and how timing is extremely important. One of the examples, as we begin to look at it, is the baby boomer generation, right? When uh, the baby boomers, if you don't know, are individuals who were born between 1946 and 1964, coincidentally, um, and those are 78 million people. At the time, when those people came back from the war, 78 million people is the most or the largest generation that we've ever seen in American history. My father, who's part of that generation, he'll tell you, you know, we uh, as educators complain about classroom size. My father would tell you about how he used to go to school and there was like 50 people in his class. <laughs> um, and so when I think about my woes about classroom size, I always go like when the baby boomer generation, he said 50 people was like a normal thing for us. And he, he said the other thing is we didn't have cool, uh, cool vaccines or anything like that. Like people had to deal with polio and stuff like that. Um, really interesting. Now we have one of the things it's important to understand timing and how, why is it important to understand indexes as opposed to once again, that market share? because timing is everything. In 1946, we have 78 million people. Um, we'll try to go through this as fast as possible, see if we can get some, some of the call response. But does anybody know, there's a particular company as these babies, we have 78 million people. Does anybody know there's a specific company who is serving babies at the time that, that, that it gets started? around the 1940s. Does anybody know what that is? We have these babies out there. They need a specific thing. Oh. One of the things is Gerber. Gerber okay. comes around in the 1940s. Baby food happens to be important because we need to give these different children nourishment and Gerber happens to come around at the exact time when these baby boomers are coming out. That's the reason why if you ever see Gerber in the label, they still haven't changed it. I don't think they have that really old looking baby. I don't think they've ever changed it. It's always been the same baby. I think that black and white one. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's still the same baby on there. Now these babies eventually get older and in the ninth, late forties, early fifties, there happens to be a company that comes around because babies need to do what? What do they need to play with? Toys. They need to play with toys, right? And unfortunately, this particular company is, is no longer around anymore. Fisher but, oh. well, not Fisher Price, Toys R Us. Toys, Toys R Us. Yeah, mm -hmm. Toys R Us comes into, into creation in the late 40s, early 50s. And so that ha happens um, to, to be what it is. Was Child World before Toys R Us? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and then after that, these young people are impatient, right? And so they don't have time to wait for you to cook for their food. They don't have time to do those things. And so what happens in the 50s and 60s, we have this proliferation of fast food, McDonald's, Burger King, all of those different places. These young people who are now out and about eventually want their independence. And in the 50s and 60s, a new fad comes along and that's when cars come into play, right? The Mustang was invented in the 50s and 60s. These now adults then have children. And that's where we have the real estate market that gets created, the big boom, right, of the 60s and 70s. These people are old enough now to start their own families. And now we're getting close to the present. These people are older, right? My father, who's in the 70s and 80s, the twilight of their time. And what are they thinking about now? Retirement. Retirement, right? 
they have all this money. And so people are trying to figure out where should I put that money? And so I, 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 I put this out there just to say that there's a large demand for people who are licensed um, uh, financial licensed professionals, especially when we have one of the largest workforces in the entire world. One of the interesting things is that between 1965 and uh, in 1994, 112 million people were born. And that accounts for 41% of people in America. And so I want to state, you know, one of the things that we were talking with students and it leads kind of to an opportunity um, is that there's going to be a huge demand of uh, license. I can't ever say it financial licensed professionals in the next several years. A third of these um, financial licensed professionals are gonna retire, leaving a huge shortfall by 2022, which is next year, okay? Um, and so there's a huge, huge need for them. One of the really cool opportunities that we're hoping to expand and bring more opportunities to Everett is being able to, first of all, learn about our services um, or learn about Hong Vu services. Um, if any of this appeals to you, looking at the Roth IRA, looking at um, that initial investment, that initial investment chart um, that I put in, how can I uh, begin to do something like this? Because um, imagine if you did this at like age zero, right? That's, that's the one thing I, I talked to her about. What happens if I did this at age zero? By the time they were 20, right, which is like here, they would have enough money looking at preparing themselves for education. Um, her services um, are completely free. That's one of the cool things about her. Um, that's why she was like, oh, it's free. And then I set up a whole bunch of meetings and now that, that's really helped get me on the, on the start um, is First thing is, you know, talking about initial consultation, um, you know, take advantage of our training programs. She has tons of different things that she offers, uh, looking at investment opportunities. Um, and like I said, it's all 100% free. Um, some people think that that's too good to be true. Um, uh, it, 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 it totally is. Um, um, since I've gotten to know her the last, I don't know, five months. Um, yeah, like she doesn't charge you or anything like that. Um, I don't want to talk about uh, or push career opportunities, but it is a really amazing opportunity. We have a lot of young people who are wondering about their, their, um, their futures. You know, some people who uh, not everybody goes to college. And I feel like to me, we don't do enough to support students who don't choose to go to college. And one of the nice things that uh, I wish Hong Vu was here because she could tell you her story because she hasn't gone to college. Being a, um, a financial licensed professional uh, doesn't require you to have a college education um, in order to enter it. It requires training and apprenticeship type programs. And so that's a good way to, to, to start. Um, ooh, ooh. One of the things I want to say is if you have any interest in learning more, um, Ms. Dina Tolley's here, Mr. McCarthy's here. Um, you know, we're thinking of hopefully putting together a series. I've talked to Hong Vu and she's very much interested in being able to get the information to individuals. This is her email. Um, we also have a phone, a number. Uh, one of the cool things, and, and I, I, I truly thank her for this, um, we've been putting it together. Uh, me and her have been meeting um, because this summer we're going to pilot a internship program um, uh, for a series of students. And if you think you might be interested in that, um, uh, this is her email. Um, feel free to reach out to me, reach out to Ms. Dina Tolley, reach out to Mr. McCarthy, because I think it's a really good opportunity um, to help um, get students if they think they might be interested in this type of field. Um, or if you yourself, um, let's say that you say, hey, uh, Mr. Douglas, he gave this presentation and I wanna know more. I wanna learn about how can I begin to invest? 
please, 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 please. How do I check those training series from the financial advisor? Um, that's a good question. So Christian, what I want you to do is write down this email or take a picture of it. That's probably the best way to do it. Use technology for good. Email Hongvu, let her know that, that you had this. Hopefully you'll, you'll use the word amazing. You'll be like, oh my God, it was so amazing. Um, uh, hopefully this helps you. I want to push more people to, to think about doing this. I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say to you that that hundred dollars per month is not easy. That's hard to me for a lot of families, but if you plan around it, you can, you can, you can have long-term growth with only a short amount of investment. Like I said, just imagine, I know it can be difficult, but imagine doing it for nine years. Um, and just generating this amount, right? Um, and that's if you just want to put a hundred in. Um, yeah, direct deposit. So, uh, and you can also put other plans together. Like it doesn't have to be a hundred. I feel like I'm a very in a very fortunate place. Um, you know, where I'm not putting just a hundred in because this number changes based off of how much money you put in initially. And so I'm not putting in a hundred, and I'm putting more in. But I just want to just put it out there. Like I said, I know $100 per month is, is a lot, but it can go a long way. Um, it can go a long way. Anyway, that is our presentation. I didn't quite make the 45 minutes to Tali, but... Uh... <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> we were trying to make it happen. Um, I want to, I'll put the Hong Vu's contact information here again. I want to, I want to push people to reach out. I think I have a lot of uh, respect and love for her. I want to send some positive energy her way. Um, that is pretty much my part of the presentation. Mr. McCarthy, I will give it up to you. I don't know if you have anything you want to say. Um, I think that one of the great things about Hong is that she's lived the experience. Yeah. Um, you know, she'll tell you her story one day, but the, she was a former basketball player of mine um, and, you know, her, she just knew what she wanted to do, even though her parents wanted her to do the whole college thing. And she was the manager of a Burger King at like 16, 15, 100% bet on herself. She was an owner by like 20 of her home. Um, she picked this up, right? She just really picked it up and she stuck with it. Um, she, she had a, a tough time. Um, and it's good to see by her doing that, it literally shows me that, you know, I don't need to tell you guys this, it can happen for every single student we have. Um, and I think the idea we're working with right now, uh, we're working with every public schools to see if we can find a way to fund these students. Um, so it could be a paid internship. Uh, I think that, I think paid internships makes, <laughs> to some sophomores is nothing, right? But it, it's only, it really only means something to seniors, but for those for that sophomore who can make a little bit of money, learning about something that's piqued their interest is huge. So we're looking forward to that. And if you folks want, want books, um, I'm gonna talk to Courtland, Ms. Dean Talia about getting unlisted links to, to the YouTube. I'm going to talk to Ms. Ells, who was a summer school teacher, to offer some of these pieces in, um, in summer school next week, next upcoming weeks. Um, but yeah, this is definitely something we're very proud of. And um, I think, you know, for me and listening, you know, I didn't want you guys to see me eat because I'm a terrible eater. So I, that's why I, my camera is on. But, um, but I definitely really want to thank uh, Mr. Corlin, who's, who's not, you know, he's not going anywhere. He's just going to another school. Um, but, <laughs> but he's not going anywhere. I know I can pick up the phone and call him. So I, I think with our, for us, it's just really having awareness and then really putting an, an, a, the investment in the students and just saying, hey, you know what? This isn't really just for 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th graders. Maybe we could have some layers where we could just specifically, or families, um, talk to 8th, 7th, and 8th graders, right? Because they're, and sixth and fifth graders, they're in a stage where they see four quarters and they see a dollar and they're like, I'm taking the four quarters, you know, um, and, or how to really stretch a piggy bank. So like how to sell lemonade. Like uh, I know a kid who my son graduated from Brookline and 
It was so hot outside, the speaker fainted, but the kids who were selling lemonade on the side made like $900. Like, that's the kind of hustle we want for our kids. That's the kind of heart we want them to show. We want them to then put the money back into the city. Honestly, that's really what it is. That's our mission is to really help our, have our kids come back and give something to the community and increase and help and support and build the economic infrastructure here um, the way it should be. So yeah, thank you folks. Um, there's a couple of things that I do want to say. There's some uh, people who had questions. One of the things that you could do um, is uh, one of the things that you could do is you could um, add yourself to our um, our Google Classroom. Uh, if you don't have a because uh, for some reason they don't like to um, let people who are outside the district, um, you can also sign up with this. Um, uh, Google Classroom. And if you like green shirts, we will have the shirts on Friday. And they're green. Yeah, do they're that. Green. The 50 shirts. They're green, right? Um, just warning you guys. If you want, if you want financial literacy, you got to look like money, right? Um, <laughs> um, and it's really an amazing t-shirt. The students designed them, um, you know, shout out to uh, Polera. Um, yes, they did a fabulous job with uh, the design. Yeah. Look at We're waiting patiently for those t-shirts. We have, we've been waiting. Uh, we've been waiting for that. Hey, thing. I'm, I'm not universal. Hey. Universal, <laughs> universal, whatever they call it. I would call Rob. I've been calling Rob every day for the universe. Oh, one of the things I just want to um, put this out there for um, uh, the parents out there. One, I'm going to post the video on here. I'm going to share also with Mr. Car Mr. McCarthy. Hopefully he'll eventually share that link out uh, for those individuals who want to repeat it. Watch. I'll, I'll also share with him one that Hong Vu did. So, you know, she can do, you can see what she says herself. Um, but I wanted to just give a, uh, a plug for this. If you feel like your student, if they weren't able to participate fully into our financial literacy program, one of the nice things um, about our program that we feel is that one, a lot of schools, a lot of places, if you happen to know some people who maybe um, uh, live or aren't in the district and they go like, hey, you know, I think my, my, my student, my son, my daughter, um, uh, you know, that, you know, my, my, my person um, might benefit from this. We recorded all of the sessions. Um, and not only did we record every single session, we also have all of the slides. They can um, go through the interactive activities. And so, like I said, we have all of them. I'm just going to like, give you a little snippet, give you a little taste. Like, if you guys don't know who, do you guys know who the OJs are? You guys like, no, I don't know who the OJs are at all. <laughs> It's all right. Okay. <laughs> my I, I think the beauty of the recordings is actually the kids' questions. Um, I think the way the kids talk about, <laughs> as you can tell, the way the kids talk about this stuff is hilarious. Um, and um, I think that's that's where most of the learning happens. So um, yeah. So yeah. each one of the things just culminated in these budgets that students tailored them towards information. We walked them through being able to choose a career path, um, look at how much they can be projected in terms of making, looking at choosing a college and profiling a college, which I think people should be able to do anyway, you know, push that to guidance. Um, here, looking at the overall cost of college, how can your student, um, you know, take classes that can benefit for them and increase their financial aid? Why is it important for students to take AP classes? Why is their GPA important? Why is SAT and ACT scores? Why is uh, being in varsity or sports important? If you happen to have military service in your family, these are all things that can give you perks that can increase um, that financial aid. If we talk to them about taxes, how much money gets taken out um, every single year. You know, Mr. Douglas isn't saying that this is how much he makes, but uh, maybe, um, but this is how much percentage is. So we walk them through choosing a health insurance. I don't know if students think about how much monthly they have to pay for health insurance, both individual and family. Um, if they were to buy a car, right? What is the yearly cost that they have to get? Um, when we think about um, property tax, right? If you own your own home, 
right? Why, why might that be a barrier versus uh, we looked at apartment prices as well. We looked at a retirement cost. How much do you have to invest in order to get the amount of um, retirement that you need? Um, we had students choose a phone plan, right? They can't choose this one. I told them they don't know what it's like to have a basic flip phone. That's not them. They die if they don't have like the ability to, to have smart technology. So they couldn't choose this one. Um, a lot of them don't think about the internet, right? Basic things that as parents, my heart goes out to you because I know that you have to make these decisions, right? I just don't know. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we looked, we looked at the cost of, um, of food, right? How much does that cost? How much does the average person pay? The average household paid 6,000, um, uh, over $6,000, right? Per year on food. When we think about that, when we think about the cost of having children, right? The cost of looking good, all of those different things. Um, we look- What was that cost again? What was the mean number again? For, for food? For kids. Oh, for kids. So for- I'm kids, trying to remember the, the number specifically. So, so it's, uh, oh, for kids, it's $17,000. A year, right? I remember, so I went- to, so I went to my son. I'm like, yo, you're costing me 17 grand, dude. Like, well, you I, are, like you're you're costing me. I think it's something. Like, oh, it, it comes up after over 18 years. It turns out to be like one. Well, so. What I told the kids is like, when you go home, you should just hug your parents every day. Every day. <laughs> to go home, just be like every I'm day. Sorry. I appreciate you. I appreciate you so much. I, I I love mama. I love you. I love you so much. I love you so much. You don't even know, but like, I love you so much. And you know. And, and I always tell them, I tell them this story and I, I'll try to keep it short, but um, my father, he would always tell me that I want you to remember. And he told me this when I was an adult and it really changed the way that I saw my, my family and understood them differently. Is he said that every time I got you a new pair of shoes, every time I got you a new pair, a, a new coat, I just want you to know that that was a new coat that I couldn't get myself, right? Mm. That's what he wants you to know. And he said, not only could I just, I couldn't just get the affordable coat or the affordable pair of shoes. He said, because you're who you are, you have to have the best thing, right? You have to have the it thing right now. And so I want you to know that 17,000 hits real hard, right? And so what we did is we looked at a bunch of budgets based off of the choices that they made. And what some of them found is that some of them live in a deficit. And so, you know, uh, someone put like, how does a person afford college? But the thing that I would say is if we have a group of students, right? If we have a group of young people who know, who are financially literate, and when they have a kid, well, the moment their kid turns zero, right, one, what are they doing? They're putting together a Roth IRA in their name so that when that kid turns 20, this, this monthly payment that I'm paying right here becomes zero because of the fact that when I look at this amount, they've generated that wealth over those 20 years that can just boom. I don't have to pay for college because I made that choice. Right. And so you know, it's, it's a good way to get started if we're, we're putting this together to set them up to have not just wealth, but what generational wealth, right? Being able to go, hey, I'm going to put together these um, tax-free, these tax-advantaged accounts and make it so that my kids won't have to pay. Maybe I have to pay, but my kids don't have to, right? And so that's one of the things that we want to do is, you know, if we're all in this position to want to give our kids a better life, we want them to do even better for the kids that they have as well. That's approximately $47 a day. Right. And, and, and when you include college, the average college class is not, you, every time you miss a college class is $101 a day. One right. class. It's crazy, right? You got to, you got to live above to float. <laughs> and that's why and that's the reason why our goal in this particular program as we want to grow it out as we want to flesh it out is how can we get parents to understand like hey let's start that process you know if you have a student who's 14 we can begin the process of, of trying to put them in a really fin financial advantaged place and one of the things that i appreciate is the fact that um 
you know, I, uh, there's a group of people here who want to, to do that, to bring that space, that, that level of access and information. And one of the things that, once again, uh, I, I know I've been throwing shine on her all day, but that I appreciate Hong Vu because of the fact that she is someone who's super dedicated at, at, at making it so that people, regular, everyday people like myself um, can, can really access that. Anyway, um, that's our presentation for tonight. Uh, I, hope, I hope that we can generate enough interest, get that part two going. Get that part two going. Yeah, I, I'm, we're looking at how to do something once a month for fit, for parents. I think the stock market game will be huge. Oh, yeah. Um, we and should then, definitely start that up. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to look at Bitcoin, and then we're going to see what we can do in terms of um, using the kids, giving the kids actual real money to play with, which we were supposed to do. But yeah. but I think thank everyone for coming out. Ms. Diatali, you're, you're MVP all the time, girl um and you know everyone else thank you yes indeed i don't know if you want to say anything to natalie before we as we are signing off um i'm good i just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight um this is a great program i think the kids are really learning a lot i wish you know i had known about all of this way back when as well as i'm sure my parents did too but they they did what they could do how they could do it um, but just even, you know, saving money for my own son, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing. And then, you know, it kind of stops because different things get in the way, but it's really a commitment. And, and when I think about all the Dunkin' Donuts coffee and culottes and all that jazzy stuff that come into the building, when I say to the kids, throw it away, throw it away, throw it away, they, because we don't, you know, kind of do that, but they're like, but I paid for it. You're right. But that's money you could probably have saved and been on time for school. So that's kind of like my, I always say that like we spend so much money on Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks or all of that other stuff. But if we kind of try and as families have conversations about how you can start cutting things out with spending that money and just saving that money, I think, you know, we're ahead of the game. Uh, this actually, if you guys think that this was, because uh, I always think budgeting is something that is extremely important. One of the things that we shared out, and then this is the last thing I'll say, because I always say that, and then I never let people go, um, is we put together um, this particular um, uh, uh, budget. If you feel like this might be useful for you, um, oh, I have to delete all this. But uh, <laughs> one that's blank. Um, this is a really interesting thing. If you haven't heard of um, the 50, 30, 20 rule, um, this is something that we uh, started to look at and started to teach the students. And if this budget helps you at all, it's a nice monthly budget that you can kind of help tabulate some of the things. And I think I don't, I don't really think I understood my budget until I tried to break it down into these buckets. And if this is, an, if, if this is uh, something that you feel um, is uh, beneficial to you, um, we can send this out as well um, if you think that that's helpful. Um, and so if you feel like this is uh, something that is a resource for you, we wanna be able to have this uh, to you. Um, like I said, we can talk about the 50, 30, 20 rule. Basically, 50% um, of your money should go to necessities, 30% should go to wants, 20% to savings. Um, and then this is what your actual needs, wants, and savings is. So you can compare yep. it to the 50, 30, 20 rule. I think the sooner they start learning how to do that, the better off they are. So right. And I am going to leave you on that because my, um, my MacBook Air is going to uh, lose its juice. And yeah. I just want to say good night, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Cortland, yes, uh, Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, parents. No problem. See you tomorrow. Yes, indeed. And so we'll send this out if you feel like this is something your family could can benefit from as well, in terms of uh, you know being able to track your expenses because it really, I think it really does help. Yep. Okay. That's pretty right, much folks. It for us, folks. That's a wrap. See ya. <laughs> Have a good night. Yes, indeed. You have a good night.
Um, I'm gonna put Hong Vu's contact information up. Feel free to take a picture of it or you. Leave. If you have any questions as well, you're certainly welcome to ask them. <laughs> 